Welcome everyone to our seminar today. We are appreciating your time and we are going to get started here momentarily. And first of all, I would like to thank you all for taking your time to join us and talk through what we are all understanding as a very uncertain time, a very confusing time, but also a time that true positive leadership can step up and really take control of an uncertain situation and lead forward with confidence. So I'm excited to welcome our panelists today and share some insights on how to be more positive in our leadership and how to direct our businesses in the most positive way. From the Platinum Group, we'd like to welcome Steve Coleman and Bob Stewart, both partners at the Platinum Group, and Tom Hubler, uh, who is also with the Platinum Group and also the president of the Hubler for ba Business Families and Family Business Consultants. From Fredrickson and Byron, I would like to welcome John Earhart and Jessica Manavasker. And with that, I will turn the program over to John Earhart. Thank you, Rich. Um, for those people who have had a chance to participate in, <clears throat> with our uh, family business advisory group, this is a somewhat of a continuation of our program this year, which involves the concept of leadership and the transitioning of leadership. Certainly, uh, this uh, deals with situations other than the transition. Uh, at this point, uh, you are kind of stuck with the leadership that, uh, that you have. But we would like to talk about some of these various issues and uh, talking about uh, what uh, leaders and uh, family business owners need to do during this uh, time of, uh, of crisis. First of all, I would say that you can't just sit back uh, throw up your hands and do nothing. Uh, these circumstances really do require some thoughtful and timely action. Uh, Jessica Manavasagar and I are gonna be talking about a few of these uh, items, and then uh, we will turn the, uh, the materials over to, uh, to Tom uh, Hubler and the rest of the Platinum Group. <clears throat> the, uh, the, the way I'd like to break things down is essentially into three categories, the short term, the uh, midterm and the long term. When we're looking at uh, short term uh, issues, this is I think what many people are focusing on really to the exclusion of midterm and long term, which is the concept here of crisis or in some cases panic. And uh, in talking to several of the clients uh, that I work with, uh, they are in many cases in a somewhat of a panic uh, situation. And uh, part of the responsibility I think that a good leader has during this time is to try and bring a semblance of order to a very chaotic situation. So let's focus on a couple of uh, items that I think we do need to, uh, to look at from a short-term perspective rather than a necessarily a long-term perspective. First of all, it is gonna be critical at this point to be for, uh, focusing on what are we looking at in terms of operating funds, short-term operating capital. Now, we're not gonna spend uh, any significant time uh, today talking about some of the things that have uh, been made available by the federal government uh, through the CARES Act and the like. There are actually plenty of resources that are out there right now dealing with those types of matters. But uh, that is important to be able to focus on that and to talk to uh, people out there that, that are you know, reasonably familiar with this and have uh, spent some time looking at these matters. Uh, your other sources of capital. One of the things that I think is pretty important is to contact your regular lender. Uh, it is necessary to let them know what is going on. Uh, they are stressed themselves. Uh, and we just wanna make sure that uh, you keep an open line of communication with your lender because you can make sure that several people are gonna be falling out of covenants. And the last thing that you wanna end up having to do is to deal with default situations now uh, that are really unexpected. Um, one of the things that is on the top of the list of many people are, is really the concept of expense management. Uh, in fact, I think this may be kind of a fallback position and I think people need to be very careful about this. Because again, are we focusing on just the short term or are we looking at the long term? Uh, cutting costs, making layoffs uh, where it's appropriate. 
we really do need to balance the the short term uh, you know uh, pain that we may undergo by not doing some of these things with the potential risk that you have for the long term if in fact you do something like that. Let me uh, maybe uh, turn this over for a minute uh, to uh, to Jessica and let her talk about uh, communications and uh, particularly with regard to employees. Jessica? Sorry about that. Yes, I'm here. Sorry about that. Thanks, John, for that uh, handover. Um, we've been working a lot with our clients, including family business clients, about, um, uh, as, as John mentioned, talking to various uh, support systems for your business, such as lenders, but also your communications with your employees. Um, as you well know, there's um, millions who have been laid off in the last few weeks. Um, and taking those or making those decisions um, with a lot of thoughtfulness and timeliness is very important. Um, we've had a number of clients um, uh, want to preserve employee morale during this time as well and sell all of the employees that they're going to retain because once this crisis is over, you're going to need those employees um, at that later point in time. Um, one way to do that is to take advantage of something like employee um, assistance funds. Employers now have the ability to um, make non-taxable payments to employees uh, considering this is a national emergency or a disaster um, in a tax efficient and tax favorable way. So look into and advise your family business clients um, about considering things like that. These can be small amounts that will uh, go a long way with your employees to keep them happy, help cover expenses um, that they incur in relation to the, the virus um, that are reasonable and necessary and they can cover all sorts of different things. Um, in a tax efficient manner. Um, so make sure that um, those resources are also available to uh, employers so that they can maintain, um, maintain their workforce um, through the crisis and in the mid and long term times. John, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, we're also looking at midterm and long term matters. And I think this is one of the things that I've seen that has not really been dealt with uh, very extensively uh, in any of the materials that I've looked at. Uh, essentially, I think businesses need to focus on uh, what is the new normal going to look like. Uh, there are definitely going to be changes uh, in the way businesses are going to be operated. Uh, I believe that this crisis is going to affect different businesses differently. And a good leader is going to need to sit down and help uh, restructure the, uh, what that vision is going to look like. Uh, now, what impact does that have on the particular family owners or the family members that are working in the business? Well, obviously, the goals and the vision that the family members have may very well have to be changed or modified. And those discussions need to, to take place. And the time to do that is probably sooner uh, rather than later. Um, like I said, that is one of the areas that I think is, is lacking a little bit right now because we are in a crisis mode and we are looking at the short term. But, you know, again, unless you have an idea, and again, it may be just an intelligent guess. But a guess is still better than nothing because it helps you then measure the short-term actions that you're taking against the long-term consequences. So I'd at this point like to uh, bring uh, Tom Hubler uh, on board, uh, give him an opportunity to uh, talk about some of the uh, important issues that uh, he has been uh, expressing in several of the emails that he has been sending out uh, recently and other communications. Tom, I'll turn it over to you.
Thank you, John. I apologize for the, uh, the confusion there. Uh, from my perspective, you know, we've been talking a lot about, you know, what I call the business side of the equation. And in terms of my practice and what I've been doing for the last 30 years, what I've discovered is it's equally important to work on the emotional side of the equation. And so the things I want to talk about today are more on that side of the equation. And so what's happening from my perspective, we are being inundated by uh, the politicians, the physicians, uh, the pundits. I mean, everybody is giving us advice about what to do. And we're trying to clamor and get back to normal and to create some certitude in our lives. And at the same time, all of these uh, courageous people who are on the front lines are making tremendous sacrifices, sometimes at the expense of their own lives, to save ours. So what happens is, from my perspective, it's normal to go inside and to think narrowly about what's going on. But at the same time, my perspective is that all of us in this crisis are being called to make a contribution to the common good out of our love, our generosity, and our sense of abundance. And the trust that if I make a contribution now, other members of my family, other members of the community will do the same thing when their turn comes. And I believe we're all going to have turns. And so the energy for, for doing what I'm talking about comes out of the gratitude that we all experience from having survived many calamities in our life. There isn't a one of us who I, who I know or who I can think of who hasn't gone through some difficult times in our lives. And there's a sense of gratitude for the blessings that have occurred as a result of that. And we can utilize that energy, that blessing to reach out to other people and to understand, and this is one of the, you know, the first things I wanna emphasize, is to understand that we all have resources with, within us to solve serious problems. And I, you know, over the course of my life, I've gone through all kinds of things that have been just horrendous in some cases, but at the same time, I've been able to get beyond those things in part because of all the other people around me who have reached out to me and supported me and so forth. So, that, so that from my perspective, our survival in this calamitous time of the COVID-19 virus, we must all reach down and go inside of ourselves and connect to our higher values, our altruistic intentions, and our faith in a higher power to reach out to bring hope and understanding to all the people in our lives. And so from my perspective, it's gonna be you know, the old adage about it's important to love your neighbor connecting with your communities, and most importantly, connecting with your families and generously donating your personal gifts to the world that would allow you to survive. And so it's your ability to connect with other people and get outside of yourself that's gonna allow you to survive. And so the questions that are on my mind are, that I wanna pose for all of you is, how can I be helpful to you? And that's the question you need to be asking all the people in your lives. How can I be helpful to you? And how can I support you in this uh, tremendous uh, time of trial? And so that's my perspective about how to be successful and how to get through this uh, horrendous pandemic is to reach inside of yourselves and at the same time, reach out to other people and connect with them. So I think Rich, it goes back to you now. It does indeed. And if you have questions, there is a, a chat feature and there's also a Q&A feature as well to make sure that if you have any questions for the panel that you can share those now. We do have a couple of questions queued up, but please feel free to drop any of your questions in the chat or the Q&A functionality uh, and we will get to those. So a question for the panel, and I know there, there are a lot of great uh, coins of wisdom on this question, so feel free to jump in um, whomever feels the, the, the need to do so. But if you think of a time when you were experiencing a major crisis in your life, what were the resources that you used to get through that crisis? Who was involved? What did you do? So what, what, are, the, what are the resources that you turn to in a, in a period of major crisis? Well, let me uh, maybe start out uh, by uh, kind of responding. The one thing that I, you know, initially try to do is you try and do it yourself. And you have a tendency to say, I can 
take care of this. I'm strong. I'm, you know, intelligent, Amen. you know, and I'm going to take care of this myself. And if there's one thing that I learned probably the hard way on that was that was about the dumbest thing I could do. Uh, what you really need to do is you need to uh, talk to other people. You need to rely on other people. You need to, you know, look at this as a community effort rather than looking at it as just a solo effort. And, you know, ultimately, even though if you are a leader, you know, in uh, an organization um, and the buck may stop, you know, at your desk, it still is very helpful if you can uh, go ahead and get, you know, take advantage of other resources that are out there. John, my experience has been an early realization maybe after the, the, the initial shock or awareness has become clear, then what I've found to be um, beyond my own capability, as you've said, is to realize I'm not alone. I'm not in this all by myself. I have other people in my work. I have other people in my family. I have other people in my circle of friends, my community. And by simply pausing to reflect, look around, who else is along this path making this journey with me? And as you spend not very long time looking for these other travelers down the path, you realize, oh, I am not alone. And I've had experience over many years, um, 20 plus in one organization that had a small group capability in groups of a size of 10, 12 people. What we learned over the passage of years together there is almost no circumstance in human life that has not been experienced by one of the other members of your 10 or 12 person group. So realize you're not alone, start looking around, start asking questions. Who's done this? Who's felt this? Who's experienced this? And be surprised at what you find. If I may jump in here, um, I do think it's important to meet uh, the person where they are. Uh, so as mentioned before, some people might be in a state of panic. Well, we need to uh, listen to them. We need to understand where they're coming from and be a calming presence, be a listener. Uh, and it's so important in all, in all these cases to listen, listen, listen until we understand where the person is, meet them at that place, and then help them through the journey. It's, uh, it, it is not easy to get through this for any of us by ourselves, um, but um, none of us can be helpful unless we are able to um, get to that point where that person that we're trying to help is and not uh, make some assumptions about where we, what we would do if we were them. It's, it's really important to hear them and to know what they're up to. So if I could add something to that, Bob, uh, from my perspective, one of the ways to be helpful is not be helpful. And sometimes people try to be too helpful and that of course creates all kinds of problems. Parker Palmer, uh, in his wonderful little bitty book called Let Your Life Speaks, Speak, talks about this time when he was going through a horrendous depression. And the thing that was most helpful to him were not the people who were trying to be helpful, but people who would just sit and listen with him and just bear witness to what was going on. And that's been the case in my life, you know, where, where I, you know, one of the things I was thinking about, because I'm one of the ones who created that question, so I, I was guessing about or trying to think about what I'd say. And it's like, you know, one of the things that happened one time is that we went through a, a fire that gutted our house. And, and, and my way of dealing with it was to, to pretend I was the only person in the world who's ever had that kind of an experience. And at the time, I was still uh, being a family therapist. And one of my colleagues said to me one day, you know, Tom, you're acting kind of goofy. And I think you ought to go see a therapist. I said, what? Go see a therapist? Are you kidding me? And uh, after about three sessions, the uh, therapist said, you know, you're an adult child of an alcoholic and you need to go to an Al-Anon. Al-Anon? Me go to Al-Anon? Well, anyway. What happened was, the, my salvation was the fact that I got into a group of, uh, of adult children of alcoholics who were all professional people. And, and we'd all gone through all kinds of horrendous things in our families of origin and so forth. And the idea of being together and supporting each other and listening, 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 as you said, to our stories made all the difference in the world. And so that um, people <laughs> undervalue the importance and the power of listening. It's one of our, our, our most underrated uh, communication skills. 
And I, I, what I will say is that I appreciate all the humility in the answers. And I think the humility common theme in there is one that is key to really effective leadership in times of th like this, because even with all of the, the knowledge and the experience, it's that humility to understand that maybe we don't have all the answers, but we can figure things out and get through this together. That is a key to, to bringing all the leadership together. Uh, we do have one question in from David. Uh, any suggestions to calm clients with a doom and gloom attitude, especially those who are pretty well situated currently? So how do you handle those individuals that maybe are looking on the negative side of things? Well, one thing I would suggest is to engage them, as has just been mentioned, in some form of listening, which draws out and allows them to express their feelings, their thoughts. So sometimes the greatest value is just feeling like you've been heard or you've been able to dump your bucket to vent a little bit. And then if that has a beneficial effect, and it pretty usually does, you wanna ask, well, what are some of the options? Because people tend to think, as, as Tom referred to it, go narrowly, when in, in reality, we're served better by taking a broader look and a longer look at what are the options. I think with um, those who have a particularly pessimistic view, I think it's worthwhile exercise to sort of march through those options, as Steve mentioned, and write down the list. What are the things that could happen? What are the things you're most afraid of? What are the things we might do to mitigate some of those risks? And, and what is the result of action versus non-action? And how do you um, get the best situation from a bad uh, hand that's been dealt to you? I think um, it's important um, to focus uh, to some extent on the blessings of your life. And, um, and that even somebody who's going through a, a, a very pessimistic period of their life, to ask them about what are, what are some of the things that, are, that have gone well in their life and so forth, and to help them understand that. Um, my daughter, Kirsten, who, uh, when she was younger, um, I'm talking now like maybe uh, uh, around a teen or a little bit younger, uh, I used to say to her how beautiful, how gorgeous she was. She said, well, no, no, I'm not that, you know, I'm not that attractive, I'm not that attractive. I said to her one day after she said that, I said, you know, I think you're right. And then she said to me, well, you know, I'm not that bad. <laughs> and so, so I think that, you know, that on the one hand, um, you can agree with people and say, you know, things are pretty, pretty lousy right now. And what that does is it opens the door for them to be more uh, positive, because if you take up all the oxygen about uh, being negative with them, it'll drive them, it can drive them to being more positive. So that's a possibility. I think the other thing is, is that in some cases, you do have to try and, and bring people back to, you know, a level of rationality. I mean, this is not the first time that we've had problems. Tom has kind of alluded to that before. Everybody and, and has probably gone through not something exactly like this, but we've gone through troubles. Most recently, the 2008-2009 downturn. Um, and, you know, when you really look at it, particularly in this country, we've generally been able to pull ourselves through. It's not been easy, but there are certainly grounds for hope. And I think that that's the thing that you really need to try and convince people of from a rational perspective on that. Now, I don't you know, dismiss the kind of emotional side of this because we certainly, you know, it is an emotional thing. That is, that is a real thing. But on the other hand, you know, sometimes you have to kind of sit people down and say, look, here are the facts. And, you know, it, it, I think it's just, it's one, another way of approaching, you know, something that is real for people. And let's face it, I mean, I have noticed that tendency in the last week, in particular, in talking to clients, I think a lot of people were kind of dismissing this pretty, you know, handily before, and there seems to be a creeping level of kind of fear that uh, that that I sense in clients at this point, you know, and these are you know good business people, 
And that's kind of what you have to do is you have to say, you know, rationally, what is, what is going on here? In, the other thing, in, our, uh, in our faith community, we have identified a growing list of people that are either alone or distant, not well connected. And we have now set out on a, a project to call them, to text or email them every week. And what we're trying to do is, is give them a recurring reminder that they are not alone, that there's someone to listen and care about them, and that even though they may have a dimmer view of the possibilities in the future, uh, we're with them. And so it, it's that, that recurring touch, that recurring outreach, and the, the question, how can I help you? The other thing I would quickly add is that uh, most of the time, uh, my worst fears are never realized. You know, I, I can, you know, when my mind starts to chatter, I can think of a million and one bad things that are going to happen, but the reality is they don't happen. And you can ask people, you know, well, how is, have, what are, what are some of these fears and how have they happened and have they happened? And, and, uh, and what can you do to reach out to other people so you don't have to carry this alone? And again, I would support what John had said very in the very beginning. Um, about how difficult it is for people who try to carry things alone. It's next to impossible, and it's the worst thing you can do, is try to carry it alone. And personally, as a fan of, of sayings and quotes, I will, I will leave this, this question with this one, is that hope and fear are both energy put into things that are unknown. And so if you're going to put your energy into something, I'd rather put it into hope than into fear. And so focus on the things that you can be hopeful for, focus on the things you can control. So as we are getting close to the end of the hour, I do want to let everybody know we'll, we'll go over a few minutes to answer some of these questions and, and further to the discussion. So if you would like to stay on with us, we welcome your, your presence as well. Uh, we just want to be respectful of the time as we come up on the, on the four o'clock hour here. Uh, another question that I would like to turn to is, as we all feel paralyzed in the fear of this, and I think we've all had our moments where, where it's just stopped us in our tracks, it's that, that reinvigoration to move, to do something and to move forward. And as this is completely just foreign to all of us in a lot of different ways, uniquely to this situation, obviously there have been uh, different situations that have caused downturns and, and, and frustrations and, and have caused uncertainty, um, but, where do you start with getting moving? Because we can all sit in the fear and we can all stay still and hope that this just passes and that everything is okay. But how do you actually get moving along with what you need to do to move forward? Well, I learned the lesson about that, uh, Rich, early in my career, and it's really a dumb uh, example. But one of the things I did when I was going to school, going to college, was I sold orange juice door to door. And one of the old sayings was, you can't sell a jug of juice sitting in the truck. You got to get out of the truck. You got to get going. You got to you got to take some action. And I've converted that into a baseball metaphor, where, uh, from my perspective, you can't get a hit sitting in the dugout. And you've got to get out of the dugout. You got to go to the plate. And if you strike out, well, you go sit down again. You wait till your turn comes again, and you get back at it again. But you have to continue to take action, uh, because if you don't, you're uh, you're you're doomed. I think. And, and the, uh, the addition to that thought is one that I have experienced myself. When I'm feeling particularly down or gloomy, the best thing I can do is not worry about my own stuff. It's to go to someone else that needs help and to be helpful to them. And so it, it's asking the question, how can I help you? But then without waiting for a perfect or uh, distant answer, just go do something to be helpful to other people. Um, and this may seem very basic and rudimentary, but um, scheduling your day to add those things into your schedule and actually stick to them as a way to get motivated to do it. I heard Will Steger um, talking on NPR about living in isolation, as he has a lot of experience with that, uh, being a polar explorer and being by himself for weeks at a time. And he said that the best thing to do for that is to schedule a time to get up, schedule a time to go to bed, schedule a time to exercise, 
and make sure you incorporate in your day those basic things and stick with it because it's the one thing you can control um, in an uncontrollable situation is, is your schedule and it, it helps to calm the fear of the unknown. So um, instead of letting the days kind of slip by um, and reading the news, it's another thing, maybe turn off the news a little bit uh, <laughs> and give your mind a break, uh, is to schedule in things like uh, connecting with other people, connecting with family members maybe you haven't connected with recently, um, and, and helping others, like Steve just mentioned. It gives you a really good feeling um, when you can be of aid to someone else. I'll just throw in that it, it's also a risk to do nothing. Uh, if you're doing nothing, that is a decision, uh, but recognize that there are ramifications that result from those kinds of decisions. So uh, make sure that if you're doing nothing, you're doing it for a good reason and not just because you're paralyzed with fear. And John, I believe you were saying something a moment ago. Yes. Um, you know, the reflecting a little bit on what Tom was saying, I mean, there have been so many instances, you know, over the years of, of, you know, variations on that theme, which is that, you know, if you don't take action and you don't do something, you will get no place. And, uh, you know, you kind of miss every, uh, miss every shot uh, if you don't go out and, you know, swing the bat. So, uh, you know, it's, that's, that's just kind of a fact of life. And, you know, as Bob said, I mean, and, and Bob's absolutely right, you are making a decision by doing nothing. And, uh, you know, sometimes that that maybe is the right decision to do nothing, but at least you want to be thoughtful and mindful about that rather than just using that in a, in a kind of a knee-jerk reaction and saying, hey, look, uh, we, uh, we can't decide what to do, so we're going to do nothing. Well, that's probably not the way that I would approach the problem. You know, you, you really should, you should make an intelligent decision about if you're not going to be doing anything. With all of these baseball metaphors, it seems like there are some in the panel that are missing the, uh, the season opener uh, and a little bit sour that that didn't happen. So, you know, again, something that, that we need to consider. So we have time for one last question. And this one is consistent with the theme that has come up in this last response. And that is reaching out and being of service in a time like this and, and making sure that you're being proactive and sharing your gifts, sharing your energy, sharing your time. Um, so if, if we could go around the panel and talk about a time where you've reached out, you've offered this assistance. What was, what was the result for both you and the individual that you reached out to? Because again, that is something that you can do not only just for the other person, but for yourself as well. So can you give an example or a time uh, or an example where that has been very beneficial to both you and the other individual in a time of need where you've, you've done a lot of giving and proactive reach out? Well, let me, let me start out by, by saying that in turn, you know, I do volunteer time at several organizations and, and it seems that, you know, at least my experience is that the more you give, the more that you actually get back. And there are a lot of organizations that, you know, are today uh, in as bad of a situation uh, or worse than a lot of our business clients. And uh, in terms of volunteering and being in contact with them and listening to them uh, and providing not only some of your time, but also uh, being able to write out a check uh, to be able to help out for those people, you know, it, it takes you out of your own, you know, concerns and your own problems at this point. You can look at this and say, hey, look. Uh, you know, there are other groups or other people that, frankly, have it a lot worse than I do. And, uh, you know, so I, like I said, I think volunteering some of your time, getting yourself out of, you know, kind of navel gazing here uh, is probably, uh, probably a good, uh, good approach. There's a, um, uh, a fellow whose name is T. Michael Thompson. He wrote a book called The Congruent Life. And he said in the book that uh, service is on the outside like prayer is on the inside. And so the idea of doing service uh, will come back, you know, tenfold. And there's just, I, you know, think of numerous times when I've had the opportunity 
to, to be there for someone and uh, how gratifying it is. It makes a big difference in their life and they're very um, uh, thankful. But to me, it was like, oh, well, it was just, that's just part of, you know, it was very easy for me to, to do that and very gratifying to have the opportunity to share my gifts. And while I don't want people to have problems, uh, it, it's, it's really, really easy for me to, uh, in those instances where I can make a difference. And I, you know, it's, it's fun to be able to do that. We have um, a family business that's in retail. And as you can expect now, their, their customary life has ground to a near, a near halt. I got a communication from him today and I, his name is Brad. I said, Brad, how's it going? And he said, well, he said, we're surprised. Um, our, our, our retail business is shut down. We don't have anybody going to the stores. And so we furloughed the people who would work in the stores. But we have also had an online capability. And we are now slammed by orders from online. And we are shipping over 200 packages a day. Our revenues now are better than they were before the downturn we're absolutely amazed. And so here is an example of somebody who didn't sit around, who was open to try something really different. And rather than hurry up to open the store or wait for the stores to be reopened, they're now doing something that's better. And I think that's the surprise. That's the core of what is so great in American business and family businesses. They have the DNA to work hard, to look ahead and be successful. And we just encourage and love and want to support that in any way that we can. And when we see that happening with our families, our friends, our clients, we are blessed, we are gratified, we are uplifted. Well, in the, in the spirit of giving and, and thanking you for your gifts on the tail end of that question, we want to thank all the panelists for joining us today. And we want to thank all the attendees for, for joining us as well to come together, to share some positivity, to share some insight and to really bond together and figure out how we're going to get through this because we're going to get through this together. And Rich, more positivity. Rich, yes. Can I add one thing? You know, you had a little, little saying earlier and I've got one that I've been sort of sitting on here waiting to say. And I was out visiting a prospective client one time. It was a, a family business over in Wisconsin. And it was a small restaurant and bar. And they had an office that was no bigger than the closet. So we're sitting in there and on the wall was this saying, and it goes, when I focus on what's good today, I have a good day. And if I focus on what's bad, I have a bad day. If I focus on the problem, the problem increases. And if I focus on the answer, the answer increases. And the citation was BB, page 451. And I thought, what in the world is BB? And it took me three weeks to figure out it was the big book from AA. And so the idea is to focus on the answer rather than the problem. And that uh, is something that I would hope that we could all do as we, uh, you know, hunker down and, and deal with the issues of the pandemic uh, that are sort of affecting our lives. So thanks for allowing me to be a part of the panel. And thank we you, have, Rich, for your leadership. We appreciate it. It's absolutely my pleasure to be a part of this group. This, this has been outstanding. The content's been outstanding. The insights have been wonderful. And and very, very positive and thought forward as far as how we weather the storm and how we get through this on the backside stronger and better and move forward with our businesses, our personal lives and get through this all together as one. So thank you everybody for, the, for attending. Uh, thank you everyone on the panel for, for joining us and we will see you soon. Thank you so much.